the introduction. My name is Rolf, uh, and um, well, again, yeah, I'm the, the engineering manager here. Uh, Fastnet, um, probably some of you may have seen uh, our buildings on the side of the highways offering a fast charging uh, location for electrical vehicles. I'm really curious who, just show by raising your hand, who's been to one of our stations with their car or maybe with a friend? Yeah, I just... Okay, okay, okay. So who of you has used our app before? Yeah, I think we could do a little bit better here, but yeah, EV dr cars are are gaining more um, more space on the road, so I think we're moving in the right direction. Uh, and that's actually also our mission, to give freedom to the electrical driver, so you can just go anywhere as you were used to doing with your petrol car, but then with your electrical vehicle. So, yeah, some of you may have seen our app, um, uh, and I'm here to tell you a little bit more about Fastnet, but then, like, what do we do at Fastnet as engineers? Um, so, there is an app, uh, but there are also screens on the stations uh, that inform you about how to use a charger, or what is the rate uh, per kilowatt hour, or if you're in need of help, what number to call, or how to... Uh, get your payment uh, done before you can actually start charging. And the engineers here at Fastnet, they're responsible for uh, the app, the screens, but also the core software that we have built in-house. Um, we call it Revolt. It's, uh, well, I will tell you a little bit more about it later. Um, let's start with the app, because that's the most obvious thing uh, for the customer, the driver, hopefully you already, or maybe in the future, that you can use to find our stations. Uh, you can also use it to plan a route. Um, you can start a charging session, but also if your car is charging and you go grab a coffee, you can just follow the session on your screen and you know when it's done and you can pick up your car again when it's fully charged or preferably at 80%. Then a little bit more about the backend. <laughs> Revolt our, our is the backbone of our system. Uh, of the landscape, everything comes together uh, there. Uh, you have to think about the communication with the chargers at the station. Think about sharing information with other partners that we need uh, to charge. So for example, you could be using a charge cart to charge your car and uh, the, we need to know which carts are out there and which one are used and you can use at one of our stations. Um, but also the payment transactions are being handled by Revolt and much more. If you want to know more, come talk to me, come talk to any of the engineers. They'll be happy to tell you more about how much uh, we actually have been building in the last uh, couple of years. Um, and, and that's something that I, makes me really proud and also why I love uh, hosting the Kotlin meetup here today for you guys is because we've been building uh, all of our backend code in the last four and a half years, and we started with Kotlin. It's not that we started with Java and we've been migrating code from Java to Kotlin, as you may have done or seen at many other companies. Here, the core and the start is really Kotlin, so I would be lying if I say there is no line of Java code, because we also have an Android app, so there is a bit of Java uh, used there as well. Um, but the team is, uh, is a, a bunch of smart guys. Uh, they've really done a really good job in the last four and a half years building this, and uh, we're, we're still going to need to do things better and smarter and faster uh, with a growing team. Um, yeah, so last and least, I think uh, I will have to give the mic back to Rafaela, otherwise she'll get mad. But uh, I hope you guys will enjoy tonight, uh, enjoy the talks of both Volkert and Nico. And uh, perhaps we'll talk later. So thank you. Stay there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We will always have Q&A sessions right after the talks. I'm supposed to be right here, I guess. So maybe, do you have any questions about Fastnet? It's a great company. You were right. So, <laughs> Rolf, thank you so much. Cool, yeah. And if you think of any questions, just let me know afterwards. Cool. All right. Good, so now the talks really start, as I said. So Q&A um, right after each talk, but feel free to come to us later as well. Um, and now I would like to invite to the stage Volker talking about testing Kotlin with Kotlin 
about Kathleen and Kathleen. Roker, <laughs> it's yours. Thank you, Rafaela. Well, uh, good, uh, good, good evening, everybody. Uh, so yes, a talk about uh, testing Kotlin with Kotlin. First, a little bit about myself. Um, as uh, Rolf briefly talked about, I joined uh, Fastnet in uh, 2018. Uh, and uh, yeah, we all started as uh, an engineering team in sourcing uh, uh, software development and used Kotlin from the start, basically. Um, and yeah, I've been using it ever since. Uh, some stuff I like in my uh, free time, I like traveling to warm countries trying to do that more sustainably. I like scuba diving. Uh, my hobbies are tinkering with 80s and 90s retro computers and listening to synthwave music. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, uh, one thing to, um, uh, I want to tell you, uh, emphasize tonight is that I'm here to learn as well as to teach. So uh, the Kotlin ecosystem has been growing like crazy, right? And um, uh, I'm sure that uh, some of you guys here um, uh, and girls and, uh, uh, um, uh, might be looking at me and think, oh, I can't believe he's not talking about this or not about that. Oh, he forgot this or that could be done so much better. I'm sure that's the case. Uh, and feel free to bring it up. After, uh, after the talk, there's a uh, time for questions. And that's also a time if you want to have suggestions or things I might have missed. Or uh, yeah, welcome to uh, hear those things and learn about it myself. All right, um, let's read the room a little bit first. Um, how many of you are fairly experienced with Kotlin or very well experienced with Kotlin? Okay, that's uh, roughly half of the room, I think. That's not bad. Uh, how many of you have just started dabbling with it a little bit? Okay, that's also a reasonable number of people. Uh, how many of you haven't tried it yet but uh, have been... Yeah, uh, I've been curious about it and uh, came here to see what the fuss is all about. Oh, some people in the back. <laughs> uh, yeah, all right. Uh, you're all welcome. Just for uh, for some uh, to get a to get a feel for the for the level of this talk, uh, some basic knowledge of certain complex language features will be assumed here, like null, null safety, smart casting, data classes, and coroutines. I will not be going in detail in those things. Uh, I will summarize, recap some of them a little bit uh, to add some context to, to, uh, to what I'm talking about. Uh, but this is, of course, not a Kotlin for beginners class. There's plenty of documentation. Of course, at the end, I'll be happy to uh, answer, answer questions. And also afterwards, during the uh, while we uh, network afterwards. Yeah. All right. So uh, in a nutshell, why prefer uh, Kotlin-specific libraries? Uh, well, they make use of Kotlin-specific language features, like the aforementioned smart casting, uh, Kotlin DSL, which requires, you, which allows you to define custom keywords and make your APIs much more elegant. Named arguments, which uh, uh, well, all these are things that make your code more elegant. Uh, also, your test code, at least in my experience, more compact, more elegant, more readable, more understandable. Uh, and they're also much more suitable to uh, to test certain spe Kotlin specific stuff, such as code routines. Uh, also, as a bonus, um, uh, many of these libraries I can also use in non-JVM Kotlin projects. Um, I will not be going in uh, in details in the Kotlin multi-platform stuff. That's uh, quite a rabbit hole. It's a very exciting one. Um, but uh, but uh, so basically, Kotlin has been uh, stepping out of just the Java uh, shadow, so to speak. Uh, and uh, there's more. Uh, yeah. I'll get to that later in a little bit more detail, but I'm not going to dive into that very very much. All right. Um, yeah, so also in that vein, uh, sometimes I'm, I use the word native. Uh, I'm not referring to Kotlin native, so there might be some misunderstanding there. What I mean is that it's a native test library natively written in Kotlin and not a Java library that you're using on Kotlin code. Uh, Kotlin native is uh, Kotlin code that compiles directly to machine code. Uh, and some of the libraries work with that, but uh, but it's good to know the distinction here. Also, don't uh, uh, put too much, uh, uh, not pay too much mind to the code that we're testing. That's here just for uh, demonstrative purposes. Some of them are a bit silly in their implementation. It's uh, the, the testing that's uh, that's the emphasis uh, this evening. All right, I meant I uh, touched on it before. Multi, yeah, Kotlin multi-platform. Basically, it's not just JVM anymore. You have Kotlin JS, which transpiles to JavaScript and it's kind of an alternative to, to TypeScript. Uh, you've got the native, which compiles the machine code, which is particularly interesting to iOS developers who are not allowed to use virtual machines like Java. 
Uh, and then there's Kotlin multi-platform. It is still new. It is not stabilized yet. I think it's still in the development. And it allows hybrid project in, wh in which you can have common code, which you can use in both uh, the native side and JVM side. Uh, and many libraries, many Kotlin-specific libraries uh, can be used in multi-platform projects, but not all of them. So keep that in mind. All right, on to data classes. Um, quick summary for those of you who are a bit less, less experienced. Uh, Kotlin has a special kind of class called a data class. Uh, they're very easy and quick to declare, and they're meant for, uh, for, for, for containing only data and not logic. And you get stuff, well, many of you uh, Java people, uh, people with the Java background are familiar with the equals, hash code, all that stuff. Well, that's all, you get that basically for free uh, in a data class. Um, uh, this is an example uh, of a vehicle, uh, brand, make, and range. Uh, and basically, the constructor and the field declarations and the getter, you get everything all in one in a single line. Speaking of uh, getters, Zatters, you see the vowels here. That means that these uh, fields are immutable. Uh, and uh, just, just as a side, it is good to, uh, to try to make data class and fields immutable as much as possible. In the words of uh, Vim, the Venkat Subramaniam, I don't know if you've ever uh, attended a, a talk by him. Very, very cool guy, very knowledgeable, very entertaining. Uh, he calls var the keyword of shame. <laughs> What's the reasoning behind this? Uh, well, if you write, for instance, concurrent uh, code that uses concurrency, uh, th then it's dangerous to have variables that can be reassigned. In a nutshell, um, yeah, more of that you can uh, you read, but I just wanted to uh, touch on that a little bit. But about testing data classes, here is something that you might run into sometimes. So here I have a um, yes, uh, a class that I want to test, payroll service. Again, this is a silly example uh, that manages payrolls for uh, employees uh, uh, and salaries and such. So um, so basically, I, if I want to test this one, right? Increase salary. So um, by the way, uh, can you guys read this? Should I uh, increase the font size? Is it all well readable? Yeah? Even in the back, that's good. All right. So, uh, so I want to test this, right? So I go to my test. Uh, here we go. So, uh, so here I have a, a, a test that should uh, that tests whether a sal a salary increases work, right? So there's an increase salary function, as you can see, and it basically um, adds up and returns a copy of the employee that has an increased salary, basically. And uh, employee, by the way, is a data class with lots and lots of field, most of which uh, do not have a default value. Uh, and are not optional. So uh, in order to, to use the test, I need to instantiate a employee just for testing purpose. So here we go. Last name is, is blah. First name is I really don't care. Postal code is I just want to write this Test, yada, yada, yada. You know, you know what I'm getting at, right? It's a, it's a bit of a hassle to instantiate the data classes like this. Thankfully, there's a library for that that, uh, that you can use uh, and that can easily instantiate a data class with either random or default values. It's called Arbitrator. Uh, by the way, links to all the libraries I'll be talking about will be towards the end. So don't worry about uh, getting links where to find all this stuff uh, that will follow shortly. Anyway, so instead of instantiating it manually, all I have to do... There you go, and there's a uh, uh, and that instantiates an employee uh, object with uh, with just uh, with random fields. Of course, I do want to set a specific field, so I copy uh, copy this instantiated one and change only the salary. Nice how that stuff gets in the way. Uh, old old salary. There we go. So uh, yeah, and uh, I'm going to let this one. Uh, so that, that's arbitrary, very useful uh, library that can speed up things. And it has a lot of other bells and whistles, which I will not go into. This is a, gives you an idea of how powerful it is. Anyway, if I run this, this test, it's a bit slower because I'm recording this in the background. Shouldn't be sad. Boom, it fails. So... Um, so, and here's something interesting. Um, uh, in the error message, actual and expected are mixed up, right? So I uh, I did an incorrect assertion deliberately just to, to show this example. Uh, 
uh, incorrectly uh, old expected. Um, uh, I should not have added this first. This is how you prepare your test, right? Now I already gave it away. That sucks. So, uh, but that's okay. You, you basically, and of course, IntelliJ is is helpful, right? It hints you a little bit. Hey, this is actually actual. But uh, anyway, I'm in case you have it switched off or you missed that. So run it again. There you go. So it fails and it mixes up expected and actual. And that uh, can be quite um, uh, uh, confusing. And when your tests go well, it's fine. But if they fail, you want an, uh, a proper failure message. And the reason why, is it why this fails is because I mixed up. Uh, this is expected and this is actual. And uh, if you look at uh, how this is a Kotlin test implemented, expect expected first and then actual. Uh, but if I mix it up, um, and because they're the same type, they're easy to mix up. So you can either call it in the right order, but you might sometimes forget that uh, that actual is supposed to, to be second, or you explicitly use a named argument like this. And this has the, dub, the, the, the dual advantage that it... Uh, prevents this kind of mistakes, and it also makes the code more reasonable, uh, readable. Let's, this is what you're kind of asserting, right? So, um, yeah, and the first one, of course, will fail because it's still the incorrect salary increase, but at least it's giving the, uh, the proper failure message and no longer mixing up actual and expected. Uh, we can uh, talk about that further in the... That's what the talks are for, but hold on to that thought. We'll have some debating. Uh, that's nice. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so this is... Uh, and by the way, this is an incorrect one. It's This is the correct assertion, of course. Not the incorrect salary increase, but old salary plus the proper salary increase. When I run that, then, of course, that the, the test should pass. Yeah, running OBS in the background really slows tests down. <laughs> All right. Um, so yeah, that's uh, assertions um, and the advantage of using uh, Kotlin native assertions. Uh, there's there's actually another advantage uh, to using Kotlin native assertions. I'm not talking about Kotlin native, native uh, like natively made for Kotlin. You know what I mean? Uh, maybe once in a while, switching goes wrong. But anyway, um, yeah. So. Um, yeah, so uh, let's uh, compare, for instance, uh, I, there's a search J in the list. Uh, unfortunately, I'm actually comparing it to Hamcrest this evening. But again, we can discuss it uh, further, better, uh, further later. So uh, basically, it, on the Java side, you have these pop popular search in libraries, Hamcrest, search J, and whatever comes with JUnit and test and G, et cetera. And I'm sure I'm missing others as well. Uh, but there is an advantage to using the Kotlin test specific ones, uh, which I will show you. Now, for instance, Hamcrest uses is, um, and you get the same, when we're going to talk Mokito later, you get the same thing with when, that many of these keyboards are reserved in, uh, uh, in Kotlin and you need to escape them with backticks, which is awkward. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, anyway, uh, going back to my tests. Mm, control E. Um, smart casting test. Here we go. So uh, so here I'm testing something else, right? So there's another uh, um, function in that same service that we're testing. This one is terminate contract. And what it basically does, it um, um, basically it sets a last name of employment. That's the one field of an employee that is optional uh, and no by default, as you can see. Let me minimize this, by the way. Yeah, so uh, you can omit this, and then it will have a default value. So uh, basically, um, going to the tests, uh, what I'm doing, I'm, I'm instantiating an employee, right? And then I'm invoking terminate contract, and then I basically want to assert that it's no longer null. That's basically what this test does. So, uh, and uh, it works, right? Um, you can run it. Uh, but uh, one thing that you will notice as this is running um, is um, uh, is this thing the the two exclamation mark. It's a forced assert, a forced uh, no assertion. I'm basically saying, hey, I already asserted here that it was not no. Just assume it's null at this point, which kind of sucks because it's ugly. Uh, you should definitely not use those forced assertions in production code because then you're basically work arounding, working around the whole uh, Kotlin uh, null safety feature. 
But if I get rid of it, uh, the compiler will complain. I don't know if everybody can see this, but it's like a small red error here. And also, if I just run the test, you can see it as well. It's even clearer then. Uh, the compiler will complain. See, only in save or null asserted. Yeah, it's it's nullable, uh, you, so you can just really nearly invoke something on this. So it would be nice if uh, if there was a way to tell the compiler that I already asserted that it was not null. And, by, and you can do that like this. And now, yeah, I'm not sure if that's billable yet, but that uh, error here disappeared. And if I run it again, <laughs> well, anyway, yeah, there we go. It's passing now. And uh, the reason why this uh, this works is because of uh, a feature called smart casting. And under the hood, if you control click on the uh, implementation of this assertion, it has this interesting thing here called a contract, which basically tells the compiler, hey, if this uh, uh, function returns without throwing any errors, without failing, then you can safely assume that actual that the argument was null and that the, the, the compiler uses that to uh, smart cast this from a nullable uh, a local date to a non-nullable one, which is kind of cool. All right, moving on. This is very, no, nah, don't know why that is. Anyway, yes, so uh, by the way, if you still prefer Hemcrest, for instance, because of those advanced matchers and stuff, uh, there's a different way of writing assertions and some people might prefer it. There is this uh, alternative project called Hemcrest with a K. Uh, and uh, it's kind of a port, uh, it's not a wrapper, it's actually a Kotlin port of Hemcrest. Uh, so you can still, uh, uh, leverage the uh, advantages that Hamcrest can provide um, uh, while still uh, having a DSL which is more Kotlin friendly. Um, I don't know by heart if it uses contracts. It probably does, but I'm not 100% sure. One more downside, it does not yet work with uh, non-JVM Kotlin code. So that's a bit unfortunate. Matter of time, hopefully. Okay. Um, let's go further. All right, coroutines. Um, just a quick question. How many of you are uh, fairly well versed with coroutines? Use them often? A few. Okay. So um, it's it's uh, one of the Kotlin's uh, 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 top features, right? Like uh, uh, asynchronous, non-blocking uh, code. Uh, like we know from no, like we know from Node.js and stuff, and this is a simple example, right? So I, I launch an asynchronous job here. It delays a second and prints out is run asynchronously. And as you launch it, you see that this this coroutine launched appears earlier than the actual uh, this thing here. So you can see that it's really running asynchronously. And then here I run another blocking coroutine to 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 join and wait for the other one to complete. If I don't do that, then the, the, the application will quit before the other one has a time to complete. This is a simple, a silly example, but basically, in a nutshell, you can do asynchronous programming. I'm not going to get into the, the, the weeds on asynchronous programming. It's just, um, uh, yeah, this gives you an idea. And how to test this, that's the question, right? So uh, let me show a typical example um, going back to my code under tests. So basically, I have this other. This is this, this is my payroll service again, right? And I have this other uh, 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 function here called uh, methods in Kotlin are called functions, as most of you know. Uh, process outstanding declarations, and this fakes uh, a I/O intensive job, which can be uh, be short, be long, depending on how many outstanding expense forms uh, need to be processed. Uh, so it ha takes a while to uh, to complete. Uh, and it launches, uh, and it launch, uh, it works asynchronously, basically. Uh, and I want to uh, test this, right? So, um, so here I have a test that does that. So, um, yeah, and yeah, if if you're not very well versed with uh, asynchronous concurrent code, uh, one <laughs> fairly yeah beginner's mistake. Let's put it this way: is just just wait for for that thing that it's supposed to change to show up, and then do the assertion, right? Uh, now here. Uh, I just picked a, a certain delay time to wait, uh, and it might work, it might not work, it might work locally, it might not work in your CI/CD pipeline. Basically, 
flaky and slow test, which we all hate, right? So to, to demonstrate this, I have this test configured. It's parameterized, but it's without any variables. It's basically 10 times it, it uh, repeats this test, just to prove the point. So basically, I run the exact same test 10 times, uh, and I should be getting the exact same result, right? It should, call, should always fail, or it should always succeed. Test run one. That one fails. That one fails. So far, so good. That one passes, see? <laughs> so it's flaky. Uh, it's unreliable. It's not giving a consistent result. And also, each run is taken. The first one is longer, and the second one is all two seconds per run, right? Because uh, two and a half seconds per run, because that's the delay I'm setting here. So it's slow and it's flaky. There's a better way to do this. Um, you use uh, Kotlin tests, uh, yeah, run test functionality. So basically, instead of uh, running it like this, you do it is is run test, and inside that is a test scope in which you actually run your code. And this scope uh, gives you a test scheduler, which you can use to instantiate a test dispatcher. And as you can see, I'm injecting this test dispatcher in the surface. So I had the dispatchers.io. That's the typical dispatcher that you use for IO, IO heavy operations. I'm replacing it with uh, with this test dispatcher. And then I run it, and then I say advance until idle, which actually basically tells the, the test runner to, to proceed until uh, all the coroutines are finished, and then do the assertion. Let's see how far. And also, I'm running this one 10 times as well. Right? Let's see what happens now. So the first run will still be slow, because it needs to start up again. Uh, I blame OBS. <laughs> so um, yeah, test run one takes the longest, and then boom, and the rest are lightning fast, like 10, 15, we're talking milliseconds here. So much faster. Whereas the other one was two and a half seconds per each, this is boom. Uh, and it would probably, uh, in a more proper, faster test environment, even the first run would be much faster. So uh, yeah, so that's, just, that's the proper way to, uh, um, to test core routines. So let's continue. If I can get my slides back, thank you. All right, just some quick pointers about coroutines. Uh, make them injectable, like you saw that I could inject that test dispatcher. And, uh, so don't hard code a dispatcher because then you cannot use this functionality. Uh, this is also considered best practice to inject your, uh, your dispatchers. Um, and also, do not use global scope. It's often used as a simple example with test, with the uh, uh, how-tos that you find online, but you should never use that. Uh, the, the reasons for which you can find online. Uh, use the proper coroutine scopes for your particular use case. For instance, if it's I.O. heavy, use dispatches.io. Uh, there's a Kotlin best practices guide uh, on developer.android.com. I will share this link at the end uh, of my talk as well, so I'm going to the next slide now. But it's not just for Android development. These these best practices are uh, useful in general. Uh, anyway, uh, on to mocking. Uh, so yeah, uh, like with the with the, uh, the the matchers, right? With assertions, you have popular mocking frameworks when you're coming from the Java world, right? You have easy mock, you have Mokito, you have power mock if your test is, uh, is hard to test, right? Um, uh, my my uh, advice is if you find that you need power mock for your test, you probably need to refactor. <laughs> but uh, that as an aside, um, you, um, uh, mock, uh, K, uh, in Kotlin you have mock K as, a, as an alternative. And I'm going to show the difference in APIs to give you an idea why uh, that might be better. Also, you have Kotlin. Uh, uh, you had to, you have Mokito Kotlin, which I'll show as well, which is kind of a um, uh, a bridge, so to speak. So let's go back to my code. So back to my the class that I'm testing. Uh, yes. So here, for instance, I have a generate salary statement. And basically, this uh, simulates a, uh, a, a function that generates a PDF file uh, based on, uh, on uh, a salary state, uh, the employee's salary, right? So basically, you specify the employee. It, uh, uh, in practice, it would be much more complex than this. But this is just bear with me. Simple example. So basically, it retrieves the salary from repository, and then it asynchronously uh, uh, runs, it fires off this function in the PDF render service. And the reason why it's asynchronous is because it's a spend function, so it has to be run from inside a coroutine. 
because it's a long running uh, function. Silly example, but again, it's just an example. So let's see how we test that, right? So starting with a vanilla Mukito, right? So what I'm trying to test here basically is that um, that um, uh, the, the, the retrieve salary statement is invoked on the salary repository and then uh, tell it to return, tell the mock to return the expected salary uh, and then uh, ex expect a asynchronous call to a salary PDF render service mock and then return true, uh, uh, which we're not using in this example, the true, but it returns something. Uh, and then, well, just invoke the call and then verify that these mocks were interacted with uh, as expected, that there was one invocation of a tree salary statement and one invocation of, uh, uh, of that asynchronous uh, render call. Um, and this is basically how you do it in, uh, with vanilla Mojito in Kotlin. You need to escape the when between, uh, for, mentions, uh, for reasons mentioned earlier, when is a keyword in Kotlin, so that looks kind of awkward. Uh, and, this is all, yeah. and this is also um, um, uh, what I also personally don't like in the verify, that you do a verify, name of the mock, and then the result of the verify, that's where you invoke the function on. Personally, I don't really like that, but that's it's uh, it works. And even with the run blocking, which is really awkward, you could even test asynchronous code like this, but it's not really nice. So if I were to compare this with Mokito Kotlin, which adds some glue in between, so to speak, a bit of a wrapper, it, it gets a little better. Um, control E, oh, Control E, yeah. And that would be Mokito Kotlin, Alt. So have them here side by side. Can you guys still see this? It uh, runs a little bit over, but uh, it should be enough to, uh, uh, to to show the differences. First of all, one exact one one advantage that you see that you have here up here is that uh, you get type inference, right? Because here in the m m the vanilla mojito, you have this ugly uh, way of having to uh, to specify the underlying Java class, even though I specified it in the in the type of the val. I still, it does not get inferred. Well, with Mokito Kotlin, at least it gets inferred, right? So I uh, don't have to specify the type if I have declared it. Uh, and then in the invocation, it works like this. You, so you use a stub, and inside the stub, then you can do on this, do return that. Uh, and those on things are ex ex examples of uh, employing Kotlin DSL to make the API a little bit nicer. It's marginally better. And yeah, uh, verify something times that. That one is still a bit um, similar, uh, even though the verify of blocking I like better than the uh, than uh, having to do the verify inside run blocking. It's marginally better. So how does it look in mock K then? So let's close this one. Uh, control form. Control E. Um, that will be mock K tests. All right. So here's exact exact same test, uh, and instead of the uh, so if we look at the uh, instantiation, that's not much different from uh, from uh, Mokiko Hotlin, uh, except that you don't have those weird parentheses. But also it gets inferred, which is nice, uh, the type, I mean. And this is like the, 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 the API. So every, and then you actually do the invocation on the mock itself, returns, and the returns is a nice separate keyword. And also in the verify and co-verify, it... Uh, yeah, it's much nicer. At least I, I know this is subjective, but I personally like this much better. It's much more reasonable. Exactly one times and co ver so co every and co verify are the, basically the co routine variants of, uh, uh, of of expectations and uh, and uh, verification. So uh, again, it is a bit um, uh, subjective, but personally, I really like this one better. All right. Um, Still struggling with my slides. Ah, thank you. All right. Uh, so yeah, I uh, I mentioned Kotlin Mokito. Uh, by the way, there's additional disadvantage to Mokito. For instance, it cannot uh, uh, mock final classes, which in Kotlin is is a bit of a problem because classes are final by default. Um, so and there's Workarounds for it, like Kotlin All Open, Kotlin Spring, those are Kotlin plugins that you can configure in your project. Uh, there's Mokito Inline. Uh, I haven't tried it myself, but apparently it slows down your con test considerably. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, and also the way you have to you, you mock uh, coroutines is awkward. Um, uh, so, yeah. So, again... If you, there is Mokito Kotlin, that is somewhat of a somewhat of an improvement, at least in my in my opinion. It's still tied to the JVM, of course, as is Mokito. 
So, and Moke is uh, specific to Kotlin. It's written in Kotlin. Um, however, they're still working on support for non-JVM projects. Although, in theory, that should work with something that is written in Kotlin. They're still working on that. But, uh, yeah, it's good to know. All right, one thing that I don't really have time for this evening uh, is, um, is uh, zooming out a little bit. Like, uh, we've been using JUnit with all these examples, right? And uh, especially if we come from the Java world, it's a very well-known structure, right? So you have all these, you have a class that, that that is corresponding to the class you're testing, and then you have test functions, and these test functions are annotated. Um, one thing, interesting thing that you may have noticed is that in Kotlin, at least with backticks, we can make the uh, function names more expressive with spaces in them, for those of you who didn't notice yet. But uh, other than that, it's the same structure. Uh, and that structure can be rethought, rethought right? There are uh, frameworks like code test and spec, uh, which really uh, allows you to choose different structures, the kind of structures that you prefer. Like, for instance, the behavior one that you might know from Gherkin and uh, Selenium, like when this, then that. Uh, you can really uh, the entire test structure you can you can uh, you can rethink and uh, do differently. And also, these other uh, frameworks are uh, multi-platform, so that's something to consider. I'll add links. I'll show links to these projects. I haven't tried these myself yet. I've peruse the documentation a bit, but it does look very promising. That's why I wanted to share it with you. All right, that brings me to the end of, uh, of my talk. Uh, undoubtedly, there are some, uh, I think there, well, we'll see. Uh, uh, if there are any questions or suggestions, let's discuss. And if while there are we any do questions, so, yeah. yeah, while yes. we do so, I will yeah. uh, share the links to the various things I uh, mentioned during my talk here. So you can uh, take pictures and scan the QR codes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Volker loves questions, so if anybody wants to hit up the discussion. Yes. Uh, I have a question about the contracts. Uh, yes. And the uh, null checking. Yes. Does it work for parameters inside the parameters? Parameters inside the parameters. So uh, you checked for the variable itself. Um, not sure, actually. I don't know by heart, but it's something that we can easily... Uh, I see someone uh, shaking no. I can say that it's 100%, but contract not doesn't work for contract check doesn't work for parameters yeah. at all. Right. But there, yeah, maybe some workaround. Yeah, it, it does have some indeed some limitations, right? One thing that I quickly can show you going back. So if I might, if I have to test, uh, I was well, take it back. Yeah, so if I go back to the thing I was testing with contracts, right? Um, uh, the terminate contract, right? Um, oh, that's the wrong one. One thing I did notice, for instance, that's also a limitation. You may have seen how I instantiate end date, right? But if I inline this one, you will find that it won't work anymore. And that's a limitation in Kotlin for some reason. Uh, refactor inline. See? And then it will have some weird uh, smart cast, the local date's impossible, it's public API property. Yeah, so there is, there are indeed some uh, limitations uh, to smart contracts, uh, sorry, sm uh, smart casting uh, and contracts, uh, but it can be useful uh, when you write your tests. It might, may, could make it more readable. All right, any other questions? One question, one fastened beer. No? Right. Still no? And one thing, just out of curiosity, you uh, wanted to say something about Assert J. Maybe you can give him the microphone. Sorry, where? The guy, the guy all, in, all in back. yeah. Yeah. No, wait, wait, because we're recording. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was more that I uh, really like uh, that I really like Assert J. But after that, you showed me this contract with uh, smart inner casting, and that I also. <laughs> well, uh, the. Uh, I, there's a Hamquest with a K, right? Which is the Kotlin version of Hamquest. Maybe there's also an assert K. <laughs> yes, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Maybe, maybe, <laughs> but I've never heard of it. <laughs> right, thank you. We have one more question here in the front. Yes, yes, the people like beer, I knew that. No, I want to be on recording, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Um, about this uh, arbitrary library, uh, it's uh, first of all, it's a reflection I check. So it's also kind of slow in your test because it's doing reflection. But it doesn't matter. Um, more important, that I'm, uh, if your test fails because this inserts some uh, random parameters, 
how you can reproduce the failure test, so how you can see what kind of values were used in your data class to reproduce it. Um, yeah, uh, that's that's the one downside of using a uh, random random values. That's true. Uh, what you well, one thing you could well, usually you only use uh, arbitrator when you're fairly sure that the thing that the, the, the fields you don't know about uh, get random values, right? So that's an that's an assumption that can be wrong. Like, uh, so th is that what you meant? Sorry. Kind of. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Like there are other ways to to remove bo boilerplate. So using like a factory methods or uh, uh, nested classes, uh, nested tests. But uh, okay. So I mean, like uh, with uh, arbitrary, you have this uh, downside. Yes, of course it, do it does. You make a fair point that it does use reflection. So uh, yeah, okay. but that's the. Uh, um, yeah, it does make your test more complex. So, so it is it is a trade-off, true. Yeah. Thank you. I have another question. Do you happen to know why do we put the why IntelliJ puts internal on the test? Um, is there any practical reason? I don't know. Yeah, uh, I've been wondering myself why are uh, test classes internal by default? Um, good question. I have an answer, I think. There is um, mm, what's called uh, not placeholder, but uh, kind of uh, script, uh, not script, but kind of uh, temp template for the test, and you can remove internal from that. So, and then it will be just all classes. Oh, no, there is a template, but why is they put? Ah, uh, okay, okay, okay. Might be. Isn't that uh, internal to make sure that certain uh, stuff doesn't get exposed uh, exposed outside of your module? Uh, that might make sense for tests, right? Wait, Give him the microphone. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Uh, in the newer Gradle versions, they allow you to uh, use text fix test fixtures, which you can use to share your test code between different modules. So if you use internal, this class will step in inside the module. <laughs> we have some ping pong going on here. I like Walker. It's okay. So test features, yes, it's available, but uh, you need to put it in special source folder. So in, j in this case, uh, this class still will not be in that folder, and that's in this case, it still will not be going outside of the module. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. All right, any other questions? Not really a question, but um, apparently there is an assert K. Uh -huh. There is a strict with a K, which uh, also follows the assert J structure or, or type of uh, doing assertions. Thanks for uh, looking into that. And uh, yeah, not surprising, but good to know. Thanks. We're finished? No? So this question is not directly from what you have showed us today, but I noticed that you're using run test method to test the coroutines. Previously, uh, we were using run blocking test, I believe, and from Kotlin 1.6, we have this new way of uh, testing coroutines. When you migrate, did you migrate from run blocking test to run test? And when you did, what were the problems or challenges that you faced? Uh, I I, I uh, made a selection of things I wanted to, to talk about this evening. I have don't have time to, to discuss everything. Uh, there's a fair point that a coworker of mine talked about run blocking test as well. So, uh, but I just didn't have enough time to add uh, to, to research that and He's add it to the He's over here. Talk. You can talk to him. Ah, later. there you go. He there loves you go. talking. <laughs> Pierre, wanna do, pick this one up? <laughs> later, later. later. We, can, we will have plenty of time to uh, to mingle and to uh, and to debate and talk. Don't worry. Speaking of which, it's time for our break now. So we will have 15 minutes. So until. Um, what time is it? Yeah. 7.45. Thank you, everyone. We still have beer. We still have uh, wine. Thank you so much, Vokert. Thank you. All right. So um, this is Nico, as you've seen. Nico works for Luminis as a cloud solution architect. And he will be talking about how the right architecture can simplify migrating to Kotlin. We're very happy you're here as our guest speaker, Nico. And Thank you. We will have a Q and A in the end, so hold your questions. So there will be time for that. Sorry for the delay, but it's only ten minutes in Brazilian time. That's nothing. So floor is is yours. <laughs> yeah, sure. So great to be here. Um, and uh, today I'm going to talk or start with a little story. So uh, a lot of time ago, let's say around 2007, 
uh, I was working uh, with a small team. Actually, most of us were just doing custom software for a small clients here in Holland. And then we sort of thought, okay, we're building the same thing over and over again. Let's see if we can make a product out of this. So we thought, okay, let's make a product. And then we thought, well, actually, maybe we can make this an international product, right? Because why not just limit you to the, yourself to the Dutch market? So that's what we did. We made an international product. And uh, that was a bit of a bold move because it was a Dutch integrated company that didn't really do uh, international products. But they thought that they liked the idea. And we created a prototype. And then me and my sales partner who had been demoing at uh, some, some conference and we got a lot of really good reactions. So we thought, okay, this really make, there's definitely a gap in the market for this product. We have to get this out there. And so we sat at the beach, literally at the beach, uh, and I was making notes on a Nokia, you know, with the, with the, you have to, it's, it's horrible to type notes on the small, but anyway, I made notes about what we were going to, how we're going to convince our, our bosses that this was the way to go. So back, back in Holland, we did that, exactly. We made a presentation, we convinced the, the, the owners of the company to do this, and we got carte blanche. They said, okay, go ahead, put a team together, and let's go and do this. Essentially, we, we dropped all of the other projects we were doing over the next couple of months, finished stuff, and then didn't pick, in, pick up anything else. And we got the whole team together. We got some help from people in, in Ukraine as well to help us build this product. And that's when a journey started. And it was a really cool journey. And just being with a team that's small and just building from nothing, from scratch, building a product, and then two, two years later, uh, you're on, on places in the world, and they're all recognizing your product and saying, yeah, cool. This is really a, a great product, right? And we were really revolutionary at that point, that, uh, that market. And that was a great journey. And then uh, at some time, we got bought by another company because we were big successful, right? So uh, that was nice. And we grew, right? And the team grew, and we got multiple teams. And uh, at some point, you want to keep evolving the product, right? Uh, but by that time, and then I'm talking 2014, we thought, okay, we really have to get this thing into the cloud. We have to modernize it. Obviously, it was a Java code base. Well, started in 2007, so by that time, it's pretty much legacy. Um, so how do you do that? And again, I was part of a small team doing sort of the clouds, taking this thing to the next step, to the cloud. And at the same time, also, okay, what else do we need to do to make this a future-proof code base? And one of the things we knew we had to do is work on code quality and those kind of things. So we did a boot camp of, uh, of a week and we really focused, got the whole team on pair programming, on TDD, on all the good stuff. And also Kotlin. We actually learned Kotlin in that week as well. And we really liked it because it really helped us make more expressible, readable code. And then, um, and then we really, at some point, thought, okay, we have to start introducing Kotlin more and more into this big, big code base. How do we do this? How are we going to do this? And we made a promise to ourselves, okay, we're not going to do this big bang because a rewrite of the whole system is just never going to be possible. We have to do this in small steps. And then, essentially, on the journey that we took from there on, I learned so many lessons on how to do these small steps. Because when we started that, I had no idea, right? I'd been running code for a long time. But really taking these small steps and being very disciplined, I never really tried this in that way. Uh, and it really worked out. We really got to do really like half year projects, but at the same time committing every, every day, creating PRs of every day, small PRs, really nice to review, uh, and just kept deploying everything to, to production. And it was just uh, such a different experience. Uh, so I thought, uh, well, that's useful. And then I saw other teams uh, working on similar problem, problems, also trying to do big changes and just branching off for two months. And then I said, no, you shouldn't do that. And they said, yeah, but how? We don't know another way. We just do big, it's a big change. We have to do, uh, we, do we have to just spend a lot of time on it and then merge it back, right? Um, so I thought, okay, I can, I can learn these people how to do this differently. So, and that's, at some point, I thought, oh, I can share this with more people. So that's where this talk came from. Um, so I'm going to take you not on that journey, but on the journey of how do you do uh, big changes. 
and migrating to Kotlin is a big change. So I am Nico Kreinen, and I work at Luminous, a uh, Dutch uh, consulting company. And uh, my mantra is really to try and find simple solutions, even when you are having complex problems, which I think a lot of us have complex problems. The challenge is keeping everything as simple as we can in that phase. And today we're going to do that in migrating to Kotlin. So when you want to migrate, the first thing you want to figure out is why do you want to migrate at all? Should you actually migrate? So, oh, sorry, no notes, so I went too, too fast. So any reasons why you should migrate to Kotlin? <laughs> uh, two reasons. So, okay, one is, no, yeah, no, no, no safety, right? I think that's just a, a really good reason. Oh. So Overups did, uh, did some research. They run a lot of Java applications on their platform, and they did some analysis on the most common errors, and NPs are definitely uh, up there. Um, so I think a lot of everybody recognizes this, right? So And Kotlin has natively in the language has a lot of stuff that helps you just get rid of this whole class of errors. Um, and it really works. I mean, uh, that, that's really a, a, a huge benefit. So second benefit, what else? And we, hmm? let's go. Let's go. Yeah, let's go. Let's go. Yeah. Sure. Oh. Were you at Kotlin uh, Dev Days, the first one? Did you see this talk? Anyway. <laughs> yeah, immutability. And Volker already touched on it as well, right? So, immutability is really useful. If you do any concurrent programming, essentially, anybody doing web servers, right? They're concurrent. So, you are doing concurrent programming. And um, the trick with concurrency is that you have these access rights. You have shared state or non-shared state, and you have mutable state or non-mutable state. And if you have both shared and mutable state, you're in trouble. And Kevin Henney has a really good talk about this. Uh, he is a very in-depth talk, like Kevin Henney always does. But it's a really good talk. Go watch it, uh, and he explains exactly why you don't want to be in that quadrant. Um, and the nice thing about Kotlin is it really helps you stay outside of that quadrant, right? Because all the data structures by default are immutable in Kotlin. You really have to um, essentially uh, do your best to make stuff mutable, right? If you make stuff mutable, there's actually underlines in the code. It looks, it looks a bit weird in your ID. The keyword of shame. The keyword of shame, exactly. So... Um, yeah, this is, this is really, Kotlin is helping you here, right? That's some, one of the things I really like about it. Okay, so now we've decided to move to Kotlin. Uh, we just do this, right? We go into IntelliJ, and there this is a nice uh, generate uh, Kotlin from Java, and then boom, <laughs> right? But if you do this, do you get any of the benefits? Oh, probably not, right? Because it generates exactly the same Kotlin code as you had in Java. And the problem is that is you don't get null safety, right? Because it takes all the nulls that you had in Java. You don't get immutability, right? Because it uses all the mutable data structures that Java uses by default. So you don't want to do this. It's not going to help you in any way. So you have to just right, put your shoulders on it and write Kotlin. So now you're going to rewrite, right? So. Um, if you have a microservice, so what's the definition of a microservice? Micro, right? So it depends. A lot of people have different uh, definitions for that, but I, the one I really like is you. It has to be small enough that you can rewrite it in one week, right? So then, then it's micro. If it's bigger, then it's not a microservice. It can be still be useful service, but it's not micro. Um, and if you can rewrite something in one week. And it's sort of a no-brainer, right? Just spend the week and migrate it to Kotlin, and you're done. Uh, and I think you see this also in quite a few companies that are applying uh, microservices here in Holland. They are doing this, right? They're just taking one microservice at a time, and they're rewriting it to Kotlin and getting all these nice benefits. But I guess who of you is just writing microservices? Who has a bigger code base? Right? There's a lot of us with bigger code bases, not because we we want to, but yeah, it's just the way they are. 
So if you just rewrite it to Kotlin, is that going to work? Because you're writing this new thing next to it, and it's going to be really big. And you have this other thing that's, well, you can't stop building features there, because there's business, right, that needs stuff. So you're building features over there on both sides. And essentially, typically what results is that the new part never catches up with the old part and never gets to production. So this is really not, not going to work. So instead, what you want to do is do it in smaller steps, right? Make sure that you integrate your Kotlin code into your existing code base and be able to deploy the whole thing together into production. So you can keep deploying it to production all the time. But that means you have to integrate Kotlin and Java together. And luckily, that works really well. Kotlin integrates into Java really, really well. Unlike, for example, Scala, we tried that as well. That was a lot less of a nice experience. But with Kotlin, it was really quite good. Okay, so let's get to the meat of the, of the talk. So we're going to talk about a whole bunch of uh, techniques and, uh, and different kind of uh, architectures that you can use and that will help you in this whole uh, uh, journey. Um, and these are not, let's say, these are not Kotlin specific techniques, right? You can do this in Java, you should do this in Java. You can do it in, in TypeScript, right? This is very generic stuff. But this really helps. So the first uh, thing I'm gonna, before we go into hexagonal, et cetera, let's talk a bit about direction of dependency. So what is direction of dependency? Anybody knows? Yeah, what, what does it mean? <laughs> How can you recognize a dependency on some, something from some, something else? That you infer this, yeah, that's you. Yeah. So let's take a typical layered architecture, right? You have these, uh, you know, this kind of architecture, right? The three layers. Uh, so the whole point of having an architecture like this is that you put your, or that you essentially restrict yourself to a certain pattern. And it helps you, right? And the pattern in this architecture is that dependencies can only go in one direction. And so stuff in the top layer can use stuff in the layer below, and the middle layer can use stuff, or depend on stuff in the layer below it. But you can't skip a layer, and also you can't use stuff from the lower layer in the, from, uh, in the lower layer from the top layer or, or something above it. And why do you want to do this? <laughs> Isolation, modularity. The reason you want to do this is if, because if you don't, and you also create like dependencies the other way around, you get spaghetti code, right? Everything depends on everything. And then when you want to change one thing, you have to change everything. And the whole point of being or writing software is that software wants to change. It needs to be flexible. You need to be able to mold it and keep changing it forever. Otherwise, it loses its value, typically. So if you can't change the software, you're in trouble. So this helps you build software that is easier to change. So modularity, essentially. Um, so if, you wanna, if we're going to talk about hexagonal, you need to understand that you can control the direction of dependency. So how do you do that? So let's just look at this one, like two layers. So say we have a piece of logic and it depends on some database logic. But we actually want to invert that dependency. So the trick we can use for that is we can introduce an interface inside that logic package that represents everything that we need from that outside world, from the database. So that, pack, that, the, that interface lives in that package, right? So my logic will only use something that it defines itself. And then in our database, we import that, in, that interface, and then we essentially depend on that interface, right? So now we've swapped out the direction of dependency just by introducing that interface. So it's very simple stuff. I, I guess most of you know this, but it's nice to sort of remember, oh yeah, so that's actually what it means. And to be honest, so a dependency is just, if you look at Java or Kotlin, it's an import, right? If you have an import at the top of the file pointing to something else, that means you're depending on it. You could simplify it like that. So let's look at that in a bit of code. So we have here our service, right, our logic part. And you can see it imports two things from some infrastructure package. So it has a one-time code database and a Twilio API, right, for sending SMS messages. Um, and uses those to save and send SMSs, right? And this import is the part 
that we want to get rid of if we want to invert that dependency. So what we do is we define two interfaces where they describe exactly just what we need from that outside world. And then in, on the other side, we import, or we actually uh, uh, in, uh, extend from those interfaces, right? we implement those interfaces, and then we, it means that we now depend on our logic and our domain code. So this essentially took the imports from this side, and now we have imports on the other side of our code base. So that brings us to hexagonal architecture, and uh, I'll explain it a bit. So hexagonal architecture, also called uh, onion or um, there's another way, clean architecture. Uh, so they all mean pretty much the same thing. There are some nuances, but I'd say the, the core concept is really similar. And if you look at this diagram, there's a lot of stuff going on. It's really a really good diagram for hexagonal architecture. But if you don't know what it is, it's rather daunting, right? There's just too much stuff going on. Um, so the really the core concept of these kind of architectures is that you have an inside where you put your domain logic and then there is the outside. And say so that part is really crucial. And the really, really crucial part is that the dependencies only go inward. Right? So if we have some code depending on some other code, you can never have domain code depending on something outside. You always have to have the outside depending on your inside. And you can, in Onion, you have essentially an, a bunch of layers like an Onion where every layer above can only depend on the stuff inside of it, right? So it's a little different from the layered architecture because in the layered architecture, your business logic is actually depending on your databases and those kind of things. In this architecture, that's not the case. Right? because your, your business logic doesn't have any dependencies. So we'll get back to this in a moment. So a lot of benefits here are that you get more modularity. You get clearer separation, uh, and if you want to, you can swap like your database implementation, for example, or your Twilio API, you can swap it for something else because probably the, the way you define that you want to use it is not going to change that much, but the implementation can freely evolve on that side. Uh, but there are some trade-offs here, right? This is not something you should use lightly because it does mean you have to define all those interfaces. And it's really hard in those interfaces not to leak the details of the actual implementation, right? If you have a specific database implementation, how are you gonna make sure that it's gonna be transferable? And actually, is that worth it? Because how many times, so who has ever swapped databases on their project? Uh, more than I wanted, but yeah, uh, okay, so a few people. So it does happen, right? And then this is really useful, but for all the rest of you, right? <laughs> yeah, you may not need it. So probably only do it when you need it, but still there's other benefits as well. Because as this inside part is really isolated, right? It doesn't have any dependencies. Wow, that's nice. No mocking or almost no mocking. That really makes it easy to test. Right, because it's it's just code. It's just Kotlin code or Java code, whatever. You're right, right? But assume Kotlin. So it's just Kotlin code using the standard library, and that's it. And it also means it's quite easy to change. And what is the piece of your code that is most valuable? Right, it's your business logic. That's the piece of code that you want to have easy to change, that you want to be able to mold and adjust towards the business needs that change. So that's the part where you want to have that easy to change stuff, right? And uh, it typically also makes it easy to reason about, right? Because you're not having to think about all these outside world stuff. You don't have to think about your framework or because your framework's not in there, right? That's all outside of it. All those things you don't have to think about. You're just thinking about your domain logic. So how does this help uh, migrate to Kotlin? Uh, well, it isolates the most important piece of your code, right? Your business logic, that's good. And um, what you can do when you're migrating from Java, you can actually start using Kotlin in this business logic part, right? Because that part is isolated from the rest. You can just start writing Kotlin there. You can still use that on your Java, Java side. You can keep your controllers the same. You can keep your database layer the same. You don't need to touch those initially. Just start writing your business logic piece by piece um, in Kotlin. And also these outside modules, they're isolated. 
So you can sort of transfer them into Kotlin one by one. You don't have to do everything in one go. So how do you start with this? Introducing hexagonal. So you can go for the first picture, right, with all the adapters and, and ports and those things. Um, you can also just start very simple and create two packages, one for your domain model and one for the rest. And that's your separation. And you can either do this as modules, so you have actual dependency, or you can use something like ArcUnit, which is a nice library to make sure that the packages have the right dependency direction, uh, and then you're pretty much done. I said this is when you really start with separating inside and outside, that's where the real value of this architecture is. And then later on, when you get used to it, you can introduce the more advanced concepts. Okay, next technique, vertical slice. And I like this one maybe even more than hexagonal. Um, what vertical slice does pretty much what it says. So if you have that layered architecture, essentially you take vertical slices for every feature or every, let's say, important part of your application. So if you look at your code base, normally when you open a, an editor, and Uncle Bob wrote a nice article about this one, it's called uh, Screaming Architecture. Um, when you open your code base and you see your package structure, you typically see something like controllers and repositories and those kind of things, but does it really tell what your application is about? Right? It tells that it's a Spring application, for example. <laughs> right? You can recognize, oh, this is a Spring application, yeah, nice. Okay, and then you don't know what it does. If instead all the top-level packages tell you about the features of the software, right? There's some invoicing stuff going on, there's some reporting there, and well, that's a lot more insightful. Now I know what this application is doing, right? So uh, slicing your package structure or your modules by features is actually a quite nice concept. Um, and one of the things you can also do if you do this is actually use different architectures per slice. Now, is this something you should do? Is this wise to use different architectures in one system? Probably not, right? I think consistency in a system is really important. So you should probably just stick to one architecture for your system. But if you want to introduce uh, like hexagonal into your system and you have a whole system that you have to do it in once, it's quite a lot of work. If you sliced up your system into vertical slices, you can essentially migrate every slice bit by bit. But you don't have to do the whole thing at once. Because each of the features, because they're isolated in these, in these different modules, they're actually quite separate from each other. So another, well, nice thing is you get this modularity, right? Additional modularity. So you get less dependencies between the features. It's more explicit when there is shared code. Uh, and also you can do these things like slowly introduce new concepts for each of the features when they need it. Uh, and another benefit is you get this high cohesion, right? High cohesion of the stuff that belongs together and low coupling of the stuff that works together but shouldn't be together. And um, I say another other benefit, right? It makes it, because it's a bit smaller to think about, it's really easy to look at one feature and, and just reason about it, right? It's not split over multiple, like, like your controller is not there and then your repository there and your logic there. No, it's all in one place, in one package, and you can just look at the whole thing at once. Um, and I say, again, like taking small steps and then limiting your blast radius, right? If you, if you apply this kind of techniques, uh, if you make a change, you're only doing it in typically in one of these features. So it helps to migrate to Kotlin in the, in using this kind of architecture because you can introduce it again feature by feature. And you can evolve your architecture feature by feature and there, well, again, take small steps. Okay, another thing, this is not an architecture, this is just a, a technique that you can use. Uh, value objects comes from domain-driven design. Um, and a nice sample to show you why that is useful. So what if I have a product with an ID, name, and a price, and that someday I decide that I should put the name first and the ID second. So what could go wrong? Well, probably if you use ID and you use your, your change signature refactoring tool, I, a lot of people have never used this thing, but it's actually quite useful, and nothing happens. This all goes fine, because it will change all the call, call signatures, all, every, every place where it's called, it will swap the, arg uh, the arguments as well, and you're all good. But if you don't do that and you forget to replace um, right, the order somewhere, it's going to be messy. But even if you have an API like this, there's just these two strings in there, as we saw already with the talk of Volkert, right, with the assert equals, 
you can mess up, right? Maybe you forgot the order and now you have IDs in the place of names and names in the place of IDs. But what if this was username and password, right? And you swap them. Are you now suddenly logging your passwords? Oui. Right, so, okay, so this is quite tricky. So how can you prevent this? Name parameters. Yeah, so Kotlin helps you already. But you can even do it better. You can introduce actual types for these things. Since your ID is not a string, right? Or it is a string, maybe under the hood, but you can represent it with something that gives meaning to that it's an identification, like a UID or just your own kind of class. And your name is, well, in this case, it's a product name, right? It's not just a name. And now I can't use a product name in place of an order name or a, a person name, right? Because they're different things. They're not just strings anymore. A lot, a lot of nice benefits. So I'm calling you can do these kind of these things quite nicely. And then usually what I also do with these value objects, so just a wrapper around the pri uh, primitive type, right? Typically. Um, you can also put some little bit of validation in there. Right? Because a string typically shouldn't be blank for these kind of things. Uh, and there's other kind of stuff that you may want to validate to make sure it actually matches what you have. So it's already good to do this uh, for a lot of reasons, like say injection sort of things. If you do this, you know that you're always validating stuff. Um, and uh, other nice stuff that you get from this is that you get this validation all throughout your code base, right? Because you're using these value objects all, uh, all over the place. If you just use strings, then every piece of code that uses this product name, you may have to check it again because you don't know if the code that calls you already checked the product name to be not empty. So you get this validation all over the place. Maybe it's not the same all over the place. So it's nice to have this centralized. And then once you've converted it, you know that it's a valid product name and it's going to be valid wherever you use it. So always valid is really nice. Um, so another nice benefit of uh, value objects is they are supposed to be immutable, right? Make them immutable. That's the definition of a value object. And we saw that Kotlin really does that really well. And we like these kind of things. And then one trick that we used on the project that I talked about is that we actually wrote the, so we had some, some uh, NoSQL database that we put JSON in and we got an API that gives us JSON. And on both sides, we created where we adjusted the JSON library to have parsers that knew that if there is a string in our API and we are received and we want to have a product name there, it knows how to convert it to a product name. And the other way around, if it goes to our uh, storage and we have a, a string in our storage, then it knows how to make it into a string. But then all in our actual Kotlin code, we're just using these value objects, right? There's no strings anywhere anymore. And that really changes the game. So that was a really nice, uh, nice exercise. So how does it help to migrate to Kotlin? Well, you can introduce these value objects in really small steps, right? You can go into one class, so you don't uh, look at your code base and say, okay, well now we're going to replace all strings with value objects, right? That's not the way you do it. When you're writing a new feature or when you're changing some existing code, you're going to see, okay, oh, this is actually a place where we might want to introduce a value object. Then you introduce it there, and then bit by bit, over time, your code base gets enriched with all these value types all over the place. So again, taking small steps. Okay, encapsulation, another really nice technique. I think this is one of the most, let's say, undervalued uh, OO techniques. Right? When we're talking about OO, everybody's about inheritance. Forget about it, you're never gonna need it. <clears throat> Almost never. Um, encapsulation is the thing that's really valuable. Right? Making sure that you isolate things and that you uh, don't give away your private data. So let's like, look at an example again. So here we have money with a currency and an amount. And now we have some code that sums a bunch of monies. Uh, so what could go wrong here? Well, obviously, it's forgetting. Um, so this code doesn't live inside this money class, right? It's just public properties. And all over your code, you're going to have these kind of functions that are doing stuff with your properties. And maybe there's sum is in one piece of the code and in another piece of code, there's going to be another sum that's going to be different. And if you fix a bug in one of them, you have to find all the places where you're doing stuff with money and fix the bug as well. 
So the problem here is that you're duplicating a lot of logic typically. So just having data exposed essentially is really tricky. At least usually leads to a lot of bugs. So in this case, uh, what if you add two different currencies? Well, that's gonna go wrong, right? So you wanna have that kind of checks and you wanna have them in one place. So just making these properties private, not exposing them and only exposing the behavior of the class, right? Not the data, but the behavior. And this is a really uh, powerful concept and then your sum becomes really simple, right? You just plus the two objects. And um, again, because you are isolating and centralizing this code and this behavior, it makes it really easy to reason about it, right? Because you know all the stuff around money is in this place. There's no way it's gonna be in another place because it's all private. There's no way that anybody else can use these properties wrongly. It makes it easier to refactor the code inside this money class because you know it's not being used elsewhere. You can change the, or freely change your implementation without the outside world knowing about it as long as you have the same behavior. Uh, so it's again about limiting blast radius, about taking small steps. So what you usually do is in, introduce these when you create a new feature or when you change existing code. And then bit by bit, you're gonna add these uh, like small encapsulated pieces of code all throughout your code base. And I used to, uh, I usually call it like a chocolate chip cookie, right? You're creating chocolate chips all over your cookie. And well, chocolate chip cookie is much nicer than uh, just a normal cookie, right? So. Okay, then test, and we talked about this a little bit, uh, Flockert, <clears throat> already. So uh, I'm gonna keep this one short, but test quality, right? Flaky tests. So there are some kind of tests that you have to be ruthless to, right? You have to just kick them. And I say flaky tests, right? Flaky tests are absolutely horrible. If you run your test and uh, your test suite fails sometimes and it runs fine the other time, that's just absolutely just noise. So um, the method we, we used on that team is to actually disable a flaky test straight away. When we saw a test that was failing and then we run the build again and it's good, okay, just disable the test. We put a story on the next sprint to fix it, to look into it, but for now it's gone, right? Because it's just noise, it's not adding value, it's just adding slowness to our team. You have to fix them, you have to make them stable. And this way we got to a stable and kept our test suite stable. And you have to remember, this was a, a product uh, that was, well, from 2007, right? And we're talking uh, quite a few years later. So there's a lot of weird stuff and weird tests out there that are doing weird, weird assertions and, and weird kind of structures. But yeah, just improving that way, the quality of the test suite was quite good. And the same goes for slow tests, because slow tests, you really want to have quick feedback when you run tests. And um, yeah, you, you, you can't really have that if your test takes a long time. So make sure that you use tooling like Flocker chose, <laughs> showed to really make your tests run as fast as you can. Uh, the same goes for bad test isolation. I see this in a lot of test suites that you can't run multiple tests in parallel because, well, they're using the same data structures or they're sharing some data somewhere. Make sure the data for your test is all isolated. Right, uh, something we did, for example, we had regression tests that are testing the whole system, but essentially we had a multi-tenant system, so we created multi uh, a tenant for every test, and then they can all run in parallel, and you get quick feedback, even though some of the tests are slow, we still got good feedback uh, from thousands and thousands of tests in a few minutes. Uh, but this isolation was key. And then sometimes this tenant creation is really slow, well, then you work on that, and you make it really fast and cheap, and then you can do these kind of things. Uh, another one is missing assertions. Anyone seen missing assertion or test missing assertions? Yeah, so when does it happen? When you have code coverage metrics, right? And you put them in your pipeline, then people will uh, will start writing tests that up the coverage, but you don't need assertions for that, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's really painful. But essentially, the only thing you can do with those kind of tests is just throw them away because they're not adding value, right? They're just adding coverage. <laughs> and then you write them again if you really need them. Uh, and then tests that are testing too much of the implementation details. There's a really nice talk from, an, uh, I forgot the guy, uh, talking about that you should make your tests bigger. And I really agree with that. You shouldn't do unit testing on a single class. 
Unit testing is about testing a module, which is a bunch of classes that work tightly together. That's the module, the unit under test. Um, and then you want to test the API of that module. Right? You don't want to know about the details, so mocking and power mock is absolutely horrible. Don't do that. It, if you have to do that, your API of your module is not good enough. You should be able to test all the cases that you have just by uh, testing against the API of that module. And if you do that, it allows the inside of the module, the implementation details, to change. Right? Because you're keeping the API the same, but the implementation can change. And that's really useful for being able to refactor. So I see someone nodding this, so let's talk afterwards. <laughs> um, so how does Kotlin help you with this? Well, I think readability, you already saw that. I think Kotlin really can help you make really nice readable tests, not just the back ticks, but a lot of other stuff as well. Like the way you can assert uh, ex exceptions, for example, is really nice. Uh, asynchronous code also, still. Don't do asynchronous if you don't need it, but it's better in Kotlin. And also, to, I think right, the, the test code in the end explains what your system is trying to do. So if, you wanna, if you're new to a project and want to understand what a module is doing, you have to be able to read and understand the test code. So test code in that sense, some people say, yeah, test code is just test code. Don't worry about the readability. That's not the case. Test code should be really readable. And it does mean you, sometimes you need some more duplication than in your normal code, so that's okay because that makes it more readable, right? Because readable is more important than duplication. But uh, really focusing on readability of tests is really important. And Kotlin really helps, I think it shines in that. Uh, so the expressiveness and all these DSL stuff that really makes, uh, makes testing uh, very nice in Kotlin. And in the end, it helps you do that TDD, right? Red, green, refactor uh, loop. So what if you have old test suites? Like let's say we have a big regression suite just testing our API and it's all Java. Should we convert that to Kotlin? Oh, actually, I say don't touch it. Just let it run. You rewrite your code base to Kotlin. Let that, that test suite in Java, just let it be. It's giving you confidence that you can change stuff without breaking existing code. Right? So you don't want to go and touch those tests. Right? Just keep them the way they are. Maybe later you can start rewriting them bits and bits of Kotlin, but I say for for starters, just keep them the way they are. They are. And now what if you have no tests? Anybody run into a code base without tests? Ever? <laughs> yeah. Sadly, that, well, any legacy system uh, typically. So, uh, Michael, sorry? <laughs> yeah, they, they just haven't learned yet, right? <laughs> Susanna, in the mic, please. Um, so Michael Feathers wrote a really good book a long time ago about working effectively with legacy code. And his definition of legacy code is code without tests. So that sort of says it all already. Um, and what he says is, if you run into a code base like this, the first thing you have to do is find a place where you have sort of a stable API where you can wrap your tests around and then start introducing tests. And then you can start cleaning up the code. But there's a sort of a paradox here, right? Because if, well, most of you know, if you're writing testable code that looks different from non-testable or, or code that was written without tests, right? So in a lot of cases to write good tests, you also have to change the code. But we just said that before changing the code, we have to write the tests, right? So yeah, sort of chicken and egg. Um, and Michael Feathers really didn't give a good answer for that one, but luckily there's other people also dealing with with legacy code, um, there's this guy who wrote a really nice uh, first aid uh, ebook, and he has a website with a lot of resources on this. Really nice, uh, nice stuff. Nicholas Carlos, um, and there's a lot of just ways of other ways that you can can help you understand what the legacy code is trying to do. Ways to investigate it, ways to look at it, but also ways to do, uh, for example, refactoring. So you can do refactoring on legacy code, um, for example, with your ID. So your ID lets you rename st stuff essentially relatively safely without having to have tests for it because these refactorings are typically not going to break your code. Okay, so we covered all these techniques. But I say the big thing you want to think about is to take small steps.
All right, question. Nico, is it right there? Oh, we already have questions. So, Nico, you can take your mic back. Yes, thank you. And our question. First one. Um, so, uh, you explained us that we can invert the dependencies, <coughs> and that makes your code more decoupled. But I'm wondering, how do you deal with all the side effects of the external stuff when uh, your um, domain logic captures all its assumptions about what it's doing on the outside, uh, like uh, exceptions or uh, cross-cutting concerns like transactions and stuff like that. How do you deal with that if you invert the dependency? Excellent question. So the dependency inversion only really changes the how the code depends on each other, right? The actual code on the database gets evaluated at exactly the same time as before because you're still calling it at exactly the same time. So there's no real difference there. I think, though, what you're saying, so how do you deal with the side effects and all these things? Uh, what I like to do about dealing with them is use more functional style programming. Right? So when I write my business logic, I don't let it change or call a service that will make a database change straight away. I will let it produce a result that describes what change needs to be done. And I capture that change. Uh, and then later on, uh, when, when it's all done, right, <laughs> we try to apply it to our database. And if it's all OK, then we, we're good. And otherwise, we try again. But do you mean that the output of your domain is then sort of commands? Yeah, or events, or something like that. You, you can use other structures for it as well. But like a result of something, you can, let's say, you have a, a function doing something, and you actually want to do a batch. You can have call the function all of times, get a lot of results, and then batch them to your database, something like that, right? So I think capturing the, the result of what you're trying to do or achieve with your business logic as a actual data class, typically, that works really well um, to isolate these side effects from the actual business logic. Also makes it really easy, easy to test. But I didn't talk about this today. <laughs> yeah. I'm really wondering on how composition would work if you if you can't so, like bleed in the yeah. effects. So uh, I'm gonna do a shameless plug here, but uh, so I'm for for this talk that I, that I did, I also made a workshop out of this because I thought this is really nice to see all these techniques and and theory, but it's much nicer to actually experience it in code because this is actually something you need to sort of feel. Okay, what does it mean? Now, what does this architecture mean in code? Um, so I have that workshop. I did it at a bunch of conferences this year. Uh, it's probably going to be another conference as well. It's actually tomorrow and the day after. I'm also doing it at other meetups. So uh, just look me up and maybe see you tomorrow or Thursday. Other questions? <laughs> no other questions? Yes, there we are. Thanks. Um, I think it's more of topic question. So because uh, if you look on all Kotlin core APIs, they trying to not to couple API to classes. So basically, the API of classes is minimal, and then everything else is kind of uh, external functions. So with your approach about, for example, example of class um, isolation, it's nicer. So you actually, I mean, like it's debatable probably. So, but the, the main is it different from. Uh, Kotlin Core, uh, and I wonder uh, like if you already compared this one. So, yeah, it's interesting. So I think what Kotlin Core is doing with these functions is really nice, right? So the way, for example, uh, this is a trick in Kotlin that you can use quite nicely. If you create an object, it's just a capital letter and the name of the class, right? So you just put the name of the class parentheses, no new or anything. Uh, if you create a function with a capital letter at the start, it essentially has the same signature. So you can fake a function to be the constructor of a class or a builder of a class. And uh, Kotlin, uh, like core libraries, use this in quite a lot of places. Um, like Compose, for example, used it quite heavily. And I think it's really nice to be able to do that. And uh, for example, when you're doing small changes, sometimes I create temporary code, which are functions that mimic the new signature of my constructor. And then I can call these from all different places. And then at some point, I replace it with the actual class, but there's not really a change at that point. I don't need to change the calling code. I just need to change the part where I implemented it. So these kind of tricks in Kotlin are quite nice, that you can do these kind of things. And the way they do it in the core is quite nice. I'm not sure if you're going to need that in your own like business logic code, because that's something you control yourself. It's not a library that you're publishing. 
But so you can still change your own API fairly a oh, little bit easier than uh, you could do with actual published library. So it will not work with your example because you closed uh, value, uh, the fields of the class. So if I'll try to write extension function, it doesn't have access to your, to your fields. So in this case, yep. I cannot write extension function. So in this case, I have to change also class, API class, and then might be leaking somewhere. But again, so it's just something yep. to talk, maybe like, yep. yeah. So but the key is, right, these are not libraries, right? What you're writing yeah, yeah, yeah. here is your business logic. It is. It should be moldable. If you want to change it, you go into the class, you change it. Right, that's the benefit. Just your own code. Yeah. You can change it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Cool. Good point, though.